over to Haggai chapter 2 as we can Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remained among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I'll shake all nations, and the desire of nations shall come, and I'll fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And the first and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord. Now this is the... Uh, like a second sermon, if you will, that's coming here. Uh, verse 11, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread, or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. And then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hand, and that which they uh, offer there is unclean. And now I pray you consider from this day and upward, from the, before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days were when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. And when one came into press fat for to draw out 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. And so there he's making a comparison as before when God has set that, that blast or that dew. Uh, so for they only had half as much as what they have now. And he says, verse 17, And I smote you with a blasting, with a mildew, and with hail, and the labors of your hands, and yet you turn not to me, saith the Lord. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day of that foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? And yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree had not brought forth from this day, will I bless you? And so there's a promise, you see it there verse, at the end, verse 19. He says, from this day will I bless you. And verse 20. And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying... Speak to Zerubbabel. Now this is just to Zerubbabel alone. This is not to Joshua the high priest. This is not to all the people. But this is a word directly to Zerubbabel now. He says, I'll shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. I'll overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother." And that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtel, saith the Lord. And I'll make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. And he concludes right there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the, tonight. And Lord, I pray you be with me as I deliver this message as you've given it to me. And I pray you help me to make sense of this. And Lord, you would speak to our hearts and help us. Give us wisdom and understanding in your word according to your spirit. Lord, thank you for those who were here this morning and those who are present with us tonight. Lord, I know, uh, Lord, that you desire to speak to our hearts and to help us and to encourage us. I see encouraging and bless, blessing that are here within our passage. And I pray that you help me to communicate that. And thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, this morning I challenge you with the idea, or I guess with the thought, that uh, many times we, when we come to certain circumstances or situations or whatever the case may be, usually we, we tend to put God's Word out of the way and we judge everything through the lens of what we see the reality to be, right? And, uh, you know, we, we tend to put off some for some reason or other, I don't know why it is, but it seems to be more real to us, and that becomes our authority, our self, our reason, our feelings, our emotion seems to be the reality, or the authority, I should say, that it kind of usurps God's authority within His Word. And so whenever God tells us to do something, He says, I want you to go out and be witnesses unto me, and we say, well, now is not the time. Or whenever He says, I want you to go and build a house, and we say, well, the circumstances are not fit for this, we usually put our circumstances ahead of God's Word. 
And that's what we've seen this morning. Where we lift uh, the reality, we make ourselves the authority instead of God's Word. And there's another side of which we'll see here in the second chapter. And uh, we might say like this, they live for religion instead of relationship. They live for religion instead of relationship. We see that over and over again. Haggai here in the second chapter, he's going to show us the danger of what it is to conform ourselves into this, this strict idea of living for religion, working in a temple and doing everything. They're, they're, they're building, they're, they're doing everything that they're supposed to do, but it's all formalities, all externals, all tradition, and yet they fail to realize that there's something higher, something better, something more personal than just coming to church. Well, you do that all day long. In fact, many people do that all the time. But they fail to realize that there's a real presence that's here, and that's the presence of Almighty God. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's something real here. There's a relationship that God wants us to have, and uh, He wants us to not be pressed into the mold of re uh, religion, but instead to consider the substance of our faith. And that's why we can say that... Um, Many people say, they, you've heard it, I've heard it. They say, well, you can have your faith and you can have your religion. You, you guys heard that, right? You know, they're, they're, yours is not any better than mine. And as long as you go into church and as long as you're hearing the Word of God, it's, it's no better than what I have. And so it's all good as long as you're in church and you're worshiping and you're hearing the Word of God. That's all that really matters. And what are they basing that upon? They're basing it all upon externalism, upon the fact that, hey, that there's nothing to it. It's just whatever ritual is better, whatever brings the most, the highest experience out of it, if you will. And that's what they're all searching for. They're searching for an, exper an experience. And so when we look here at the children of Israel, and they're coming here to the house of God, and there's a particular day that they're coming. The feast, uh, the festivities are about ready to take place. And they're coming and they're looking at the house of God, the, the work of their hands, and, and considering the fact that, that God is the one that made all of this possible, laying the foundation and building the work. God had made all of this possible for them to be able to do it. And they come to it and they say, wow, there's really nothing here. This is just a small work. This is just a small thing. This is just little in our sight. And they fail to realize the person that fills the house of God, the, 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 the God of the universe here fills it with His glory. They fail to realize that there's something more than the religion, but there's a relationship that God wants us to have, and there's more than what meets the eye. Uh, the common person will look on the outside, and I'll just use this as an, an example. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of impressed at times when you go to the hospital and you, you say, well, these Shriners, they come out and, they, and they're helping all these kids and they're paying so much and they're, they're helping out left and right and they're doing all these good things. And the person on the outside, not knowing what's on the inside, the, 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 the occult that's there, the satanic influence that's right in behind it, they'll look on the outside and say, wow, that's wonderful, that's great. Look at all the children that they're helping. Look at what kind of influence that they have. They're helping families. They're building. They're doing great things and not realizing the invisible thing that's hidden behind the doors. And what a satanic influence of that religion that it is. Not realizing how evil that's in behind it or what they're worshiping and serving. See, on the outside it looks great, but on the inside it's not so good. Uh, I, I don't know... I guess maybe this was, uh, when I was younger we used to have these, these books and uh, I don't know if it was something new during the time or uh, something that's just always been, I'm not quite sure, but I looked down through these books and uh, at first there appears to be nothing there, there's nothing but patterns and uh, just sort of line upon line is a repeated pattern over and over and over again and I thought to myself this is but a blank page. And my sister, she would say, well, look at this page again. And so there's nothing there. She says, well, you kind of got to twist your eyes and kind of like go cross-eyed a little bit, and then the image will pop off of the page. I said, that don't sound like very much fun. and make your eyes water just by doing it. And it, the, the idea is when you ever 
uh, stare at it long enough for probably a few minutes, three, four, five minutes sometimes. Next thing you know, these like hot air balloons will pop out of the, the image there. Or, and what I'm saying to you, there's more than what meets the eye that you don't really see. And these are here are going into the house of God, and they say, well, it's all the same. It's all formalism. It's all tradition. It's all rituals. It's all just like everything else. And God wants us to see that there's something else that's there. His presence. His power. His protection, His provision, His grace, His love, His mercy, all that is there. Can I say to you tonight that there's more to Christianity than formalism. It's a faith that you and I have. Haggai's a very practical prophet. In fact, you know, he just kind of lays it all down. I mean, he's not mincing words. He gives it to a, a message that's plain. He's not like Isaiah. It just seems to lay out prophecy after prophecy. I mean, 65 chapters worth. He's not like Jeremiah or Ezekiel that has a whole lot to say. He's a man who's of simple words and just gets straight to the point and he says, this is the way that it is. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to see. And here he's trying to lead the children of Israel to, the, to a right understanding of who God is. What you're doing is important. The work is not just something that you do just to feel satisfied about yourself. What you're doing is very important. What you're doing is significant. What you're doing has the, the approval of God upon it. And so he gives the children of Israel a vision for the coming day when the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants will literally be fulfilled. And uh, he's looking into the future to show them, hey, your work has value. What you're doing and coming to the house of God and serving in a house of God, there's value to it. And I want you to see with me very quickly tonight these three points. His presence, His provision, and His position. I, I, I struggled there with that last one because I, I see God's position, how He's over everything and uh, oversees everything, but I see also protection. And it's kind of hard to figure which one do you choose. But His presence... The timing here is kind of instructive. Well, not kind of. It is instructive and very important for us to grasp. Less than a full month has been there. They've been in the work here. Uh, Haggai chapter 1 verse 15, it says, In four and twentieth day of the sixth month in Darius the king. But when we go to chapter 1, it says it was the seventh month. And the one and twentieth day of the month. And so it's, it's less than a full month away that they come and they've been working and they've been serving and they've been at it, just constantly building and building and building to make everything come to a full, full circle, to build it up to what it is. Less than a full month these children have been serving and building and doing what God has commanded them to do with joy and with strength, with the power of God with them. God's presence was with them. He has stirred up their spirits to the work. We had seen that previously. Now they're faced with a, some very many events that are coming on the calendar. This is a time of month, uh, uh, Tishri, uh, you know, it's the time of October, okay? You and I, when we get to October, we realize that there's a lot of events that's going to take place. We come to elections, and the ne next thing you come to is Thanksgiving, whether it's Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, then we got other events on our calendars leading all the way up. Into, so our calendars are pretty full, but the Jewish calendar is full as well. They have not only the Sabbath that they're keeping, they have the Feast of Trumpets, they have the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and they have the Day of Atonement. All of this is factored in uh, to this, this, this month that they're in now. As they've been building their face with these different feasts that are coming up against them. So from the 15th day, and I want to look here at the Feast of Tabernacles because this is where they're at. It says, from the 15th day to the 21st day of the month was the Feast of Tabernacles, which is recorded in Leviticus 23, verses 34 through 44. Um, what this feast was all about, it was a final religious celebration of Israel's calendar. Uh, they commemorated, first of all, the end of the autumn harvest, and they we talk about all the God, God has provided for them. You know, they, they've been raising their crops all the while, and then this is the Feast of Tabernacles. They, they, they gather in all their, their substance that God has given to them, the Feast of the Harvest. But then they remember what God has done for them. There's a wandered around through that 40 days, or 40 years in the wilderness. It's a commemoration of this time that they're 
they're looking forward to and anticipating those 40 years where God had washed over for them and provided for them and protected them and met every one of their needs. He led them there through the wilderness for those 40 years. And they would look to, to God who uh, looked after them and took care of them when they lived in their tents. Seven days were set apart for the celebration. Little tents were being constructed out of palm trees, willow trees, I mean pretty much whatever tree that you could find with leaves upon it, and they would gather them together, they would make them into nice little tents and booths or whatever you want to call them. They would take some of the, the, the fruit, kind of decorate it up, you know, sort of like what you do for Thanksgiving. You get those little, I don't know, I call them horn shapes. I, I, I don't know what they're called, like little scones almost. And they got like the little pumpkin that comes out and the grapes and so forth. I mean, they would decorate. That's what people do. They, they decorate the house. Hopefully it was the women that were decorating. But nonetheless, they decorated with beautiful fruit from the harvest. And every day some, uh, during this, this feast, they would go down seven days. And there was a procession that went down to the Gihon Springs. They would fill up this pitcher, a uh, golden pitcher particularly set aside for this, this little feast. And they would go down to the Gihon Springs and they would dip out the water and make a procession back into the tabernacle where it was, or, or the temple now at this time. And they would take that water and pour it around the altar in recognition about how God had provided that water for them that whole time that they were in the wilderness. That water that came from the rock. Not everybody gets water out of a rock. But this water God had provided for them. Now, this same thing was interesting to me because I, I think to myself, I just got done preaching through John. Well, it was the last year. It might have been last year that I might have preached a message out of John chapter 7. But Jesus here, He stands and He cries. The Bible says in John chapter 7, verses 38 through 39, He says, uh, Jesus saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And the Apostle Paul would tell us over the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and they all drank of that spiritual rock, which was Christ. Right? I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but they've been busy. They've been working. The feast days are upon them. And they say to himself, we don't have time for a feast. We don't have time for all of this. It's supposed to be a time of celebration, but yet they're not really rejoicing. They're not really celebrating. But what's the day all about? It's about Jesus Christ, is it not? It's about the gifts that He's giving amongst men the Holy Spirit, which He would give to all believers after His resurrection from the dead. And He said, you know... If I go into my Father, then I'll give you gifts. And He blessed us. He gave many gifts to the, the, the evangelists, teachers, preachers, and so forth. He gave gifts among men. They're not seeing it. It's just another day for them. They're like, well, we've got to go to church today. We've got to go down to the river and follow this procession. What's this all about? We've got work to do. And they missed that it's all about a person. It's all about Christ. The significance of the day, it speaks of the promise of the gift of God and the Holy Spirit. But the festival is just a festival without the Spirit of God in it. And all they notice when they come to the tabernacle is look at this insignificant house that we're coming to. Look at this insignificant place that we're worshiping in. This is not like the tabernacle that we had back in Solomon's day. This is not like the great tabernacle that some of you remember. Here they, they, they draw the memory. God draws their memory. He says, verse 3, Who was left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And they, probably very few of them raised their hands, but they, they remembered. How many of you were there when this temple was dedicated? When God's presence filled the house and nobody could stand before His presence? How many of you remember Solomon's prayer when he stood before it? Pray for God's blessing upon the house. When he dedicated the temple. How many of you remember that time? 
they look at this house and it's not like the first house. And he asked them, how do you see it now? How do you see it now? How do you view the house of God now? And I like this next question. Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? In other words, are you viewing the house of God as nothing right now? We would never say something like that. We'd never come to the doors and say, well, I could take it or leave it. It's nothing to me. This seems to be the impression that I get from this text, from this passage. The joy had left their heart and they failed to notice God's presence. Although it was God that stirred their heart by the Word of God and it was God that uh, enabled them, gave them the ability to build and to do this work. But after a while, it began to get old for them. Consider with me uh, not only the questions and the disappointment that we see here, not only that it was despised and esteemed as nothing, but he seems to move on by just giving three commands followed by an explanation. He doesn't really seem to uh, follow through with why he's asking the questions if you follow me. But he gives these three commands. He says, be strong. In other words, keep going at the work. Keep following through. Keep working. Keep. And, well, that's actually the next command there in verse 4. In verse uh, that first beginning of verse 4 says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. It tells him, O Joshua, son of Joshua, take the high priest, be strong, all ye people. Be strong, saith the Lord God, and work. And so there's these three commands to be strong, to work, to get back at it, and to, and to fear not. You only want to work for what you believe in, right? What you find value in. Many times, unfortunately, we find value in what we do. And God's not so much taking notice about what we do and what we're able to bring to Him. He's not so much impressed about that. God, God's not wanting what we, so, so much about what we can build and how we can serve and all these things. What God is concerned about is for us to give ourselves unto Him as a living sacrifice. For us to be invested all in and to put our hands into the work, our, our heart, our mind, our soul, all in for the work. That's what He's concerned about. But they don't really seem to get it. They come to the house of God, yeah, we worked hard. But it's still nothing. Failing to realize that God just wants all of them to be all in it. And God is not as much interested in what we can offer as much as what He's interested in offering ourselves. The building... Or what is inside the building may be disappointed to you, but you realize that it's all about the presence of God. Uh, I don't know about you, but studying down through, and I'm looking here about how this building here, this tabernacle, this house of God was despised. My mind goes back to Isaiah 53. The Bible says that Jesus was despised and rejected men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. And we, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And I can't help but think that maybe this was a, a pattern of what they were to look forward to in the future. You know how you despise this house? There's going to come one one day, a babe born in a manger. And there's going to be people that's going to despise him. He's going to be a root out of dry ground. He want to have no form nor comeliness. There's no beauty that we should desire him. They want to look at him and they say, "Is he really? There's no way that this guy could be the Christ." Oh, he's from Nazareth, not understanding that he was born in Bethlehem. And all the while, this is your savior, but you missed out upon it because you didn't see the presence of God in him. And the presence of God, he was Jesus Christ was God robed in the flesh, and yet everybody looked past it and missed it. And I can't help but see that here in this passage. Haggai demonstrates to us the personal God who's intimately involved directly in the lives of his people, and this is the God who uh, loved him so much, the Bible says, that he covenanted with him. You see that there in verse 5. He says, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. You don't just covenant with somebody that, without regard for them. Without love for them. 
That's like trying to get married to somebody and you don't really love them. You're just there for the money, you know? This is true love. God went out of His way to redeem the children of Israel and bring them out of Egypt. I mean, He's putting His namesake on the line. He's putting His, His, His worthiness upon the line. God had covenant with His people of Israel shows His love and how, how the best I can put it in words is just His power, what length and what depth He's willing to go for His people. And the Bible says that even in the midst of all their sins, even in the fact that their spiritual adultery and going astray, and the fact that He had to send them in 70 years of captivity, I can't help but notice, it says, but my spirit remaineth among you, fear you not. Can you imagine that? His presence is there. And that's the thing that matters. Think with me not only about His presence and understanding it's not about religion, but it's about relationship, but also His provision. Verses 10 through 14, God uh, asked another series of questions, and they all point back to the Levitical law. And here, Haggai brings up the performance of the law and, uh, and parts of the law that He wants them to see. And every one of them, you know, those who are the priests, they'll be in the tip. The, tabernacle there or the temple, whatever the case may be, and they're offering up on the, upon the altar, they're offering sacrifices, and they, they were understanding that they knew the law, and it brings to them uh, the law, and it points it out to them. Leviticus chapter 6, verses 25 through 26, and verse 29, the, the, uh, bring out these three verses, it says, Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. And the place where the burnt offering is killed shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It's most holy. The priest that offer it for the sin shall eat it, and in the holy place shall it be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then in verse 29 it says, All the males among the priests shall eat thereof. It's most holy. Now when you look at the questions, and I'm not going to go back down and read through them again, but when you look at the questions... It seems like he's asking one real refrain that keeps going through the mind, what's holy and what's unclean? Is it the sacrifices that you're offering? Is it the sacrifice that God wants? Does the sacrifice make you holy? Or does it make you unclean? It begins to point out down through here, they say, well... Uh, well, let me just, uh, I said that I wasn't going to read it, but um, in verse 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or meat, or shall it be holy? And the priest said, No. And he gets down through and he's asking all these questions about what's holy and what's unclean. Look at verse 14. Because this gets down to the heart of the matter. So then answered Haggai and said, So is this people and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. So is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean. So I don't care how many sacrifices you offer. It's not going to make you clean. You know, Prophet Samuel would say in the Old Testament, obedience is better than sacrifice. There's plenty of people that can go, you know, they offer all kinds of things. But what's the sacrifice all about? God wants our heart. That's what God does for us. All of us are, you know, as all our righteousness, as Isaiah would say, as an unclean thing. And it's the same thing that Haggai is pointing out. There's nothing that we can offer unto God. There's no service that we can do to repay God. There's no offering that we can give Him to make Him satisfied with, with what we're doing. There's none of these externals. Please, God, there's something that He must do. And so He comes down through and seems to be completely unrelated. When we look at the sacrifices and the performance of the law, he brings up the, the, the past and then the, the presence as well. The children of Israel were to consider the fact that their disobedience had brought judgment. In verses 15 through 17, he tells them to consider from this day upward, from before the stone was laid upon a stone in the temple, 
Since the days there were, when one came to heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. And when one came in the press fat for to draw fifty vessels, there were but twenty. And you're like, what does that have to do with the Levitical sacrifice system? God's pointing out to him that he's got to provide for us. And just as he's provided for us to, uh, the, the, the provision, the abundance, or the blessing, or, or whatever you want to call it, he's got to provide our salvation too. Everything that we need must come from God. And he tells us in the promise of verse 20, he says, And from this day will I bless you. Why? Because of their faith. When they were disobeying, they, they faced judgment. When they, when they were obeying, when they were acting in faith, God had blessed them. It's because of their faith that God says, from this day on, I'll bless you. And God's only interested in our faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Haggai tells the people this unfashionable truth, that all the work of our hands are His unclean things. God wants us to live by faith. God's not as much interested on the outside as He is on the inside. Haggai, again, brings up the promise, which is a picture of God's grace, and the children of Israel didn't deserve it, they didn't earn it, they couldn't work for it. And God gave it freely because of their response in faith. We must put purity, heart, mind, and soul, trusting God before our prosperity. Then our position as I come here to the end. Here's a direct message given to the governor of the land, Zerubbabel. Directed strictly to him and to him only. Persecution was still abounding. They were still faced with that day in and day out. Everyone still wanting to see the work of God to stop and to cease. There were problems left and right. The workers were still being hounded. His job wasn't an easy one. You know, it's sort of like Working like you did, working pipe fitting and dealing with these workers all around you, you know, they want to see you lose your cool. He's faced with that. But he's a representative of God, a representative of his grace, if I could say it that way. But here comes a word from the prophet and assurance that God will take care of his. His enemies. He says, you know, God's going to shake the heavens and the earth. He'll deal with these nations. He'll, in fact, in verse 22, He says, I want to overthrow all these kingdoms, all the enemies of God. I want to overthrow them. And I'll deal with them. As a signet, He tells them here in verse 23, He says, I want to make you a signet. Drubable. A signet was something that was very special to its owner. You remember there, uh, Hasuerus? where he gives his signet ring over to uh, Haman at one time, and then he gives it over to Mordecai another time, and somebody has a signet ring, and they begin to stamp that mold upon whatever wax seal or whatever letter it is. It gives the, divine, it gives the approval there of that king. And so it represents the, uh, the official authority of the king, right? This guy here has a divine approval of God. Isn't that something? The divine approval of God upon him. Uh, a king would never part with his signet, but he would give his, his authority and delegate it to others. He tells the church, and Jesus tells the church over Matthew 16, 18, He says, The gates of hell shall not be able to prevail against us. Zerubbabel, as God's signet ring, would stand as the official representative of the Davidic throne. We look back, and if you go back to the Old Testament, there was a king by the name of Jehoiakim. What kind of king was he? The one that did evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, he didn't last very long upon the throne. God disinherited him. He was Zerubbabel, the grandson of that guy. I call that Grace. A grandson of a, an evil king, one that just came back from captivity, and yet this is going to be the one who's going to have that, that divine stamp there, the approval, uh, being a representative of the Davidic dynasty and represent the restoration of the Messiah's bloodline. 
that had been interrupted by the Babylonian captivity. And now Zerubbabel appears in the bloodline, both of Joseph's uh, bloodline and Mary. You look back in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. You'll see his name mentioned. Look over at Luke chapter 3, verse 27, Mary's bloodline. You'll see this guy's name mentioned. The Bible ends here. Well, not the Bible, but this, this prophecy that's given here. It ends with the words, For I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Though all the world may crumble around us, and things don't go the way that they want to, God says, I have my hand upon you, Zerubbabel. There's, as long as my hand's upon you, you're going to be all right. Life's not going to be easy for you, but you got my hand of approval there for you. The work must go on. It must continue. It doesn't stop, but the only way that you're going to continue it there was by my presence. And over and over again, I see the Lord of hosts. It means it has this, God's putting all of His army, all of His power, all of His authority as a commander of all the armies of heaven standing there. I'm for you. I get back up. This is like uh, Elisha. He says, open up the eyes of my servant when all the Syrian army was coming up against him and he sees all these chariots of fire. Those who be with us are more than they would be with them. Jerubbabel could say, God's hand's upon this work. God's hand is upon me. And we will continue to work. Understand something tonight. We may not have much, but I don't want you to despise what we have here. I want you to understand that we have God's presence. And if we don't see that, then we're missing out on everything. We ought not to treat this place as nothing. But we ought to treat it with the greatest respect because of the one who's here and with reverence and awe and wonder. We ought to understand that He's behind us, yeah? Life goes on. One day, this young man that you see behind this pulpit, if the Lord don't come, I'll pass on and somebody else will fill my shoes. But God's hand is upon this work. God's hand is upon the church. And as long as we stand for Christ and keep continuing His Word, He'll bless us. And I'm thankful for that truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for the strength there is to, to, to follow through with Your Word. And Lord, I'm thankful to come to a place where we realize that Your presence is here. The Word to live by faith and not by sight. And I pray that You would just give us respect as we come to Your Word. A respect as we come to the house of worship. Lord, help us to love You as You deserve to be loved. And Lord, we thank You for Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we love You in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet. We want to sing a hymn of invitation just real quick. Hymn number th uh, two, 276, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. Hymn number 276. I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, take thy cross and follow, follow me. I'll go with Him through the garden. I'll go with Him through the garden. I'll go with Him through the garden. I'll go with Him, with Him all the way. Verse 4. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. And go with me, with me all the way. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening in and hope this message was a blessing to you. Let's dismiss with a word of prayer and thank you for uh, showing up tonight and showing you respect for God. And Brother Sheila, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer?